Okay, thank you very much, Blakely. Uh, good morning and good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in whichever part of the world. Thank you very much for joining. This is the first in our series uh, pertaining to vaccines against diseases, which the Validate Network uh, focuses on. So, as you know, the Validate Network is involved in the development of vaccines which are targeting globally significant diseases. And the ones that we have are include uh, vaccines against tuberculosis, leishmaniasis, meliodosis, leprosy. At the moment, we have four, but I'm sure the number will expand. And the important thing is that we focus on the research being cross-pathogen, cross-continent, cross-species, even within the pathogen, cross-disciplines, and very much encourage collaborations. So it is in that spirit that we decided to start this series. So our first today is, uh, we're going to be talking about vaccines against leishmaniasis. I understand most of you who are here are not leishmania vaccinologists. So we'll start from the ABC of uh, what we know about vaccines. And then I'll hand over to somebody who's actually doing some hands-on work, uh, Dr. Mohammed Usman, will follow after I speak. So to begin with, uh, we know the success story with COVID-19, which is a zoonosis, which where we have an excellent success story with regard to vaccines. We have another zoonosis, which is leishmaniasis, which has been known for much, much longer perhaps than uh, COVID. But we unfortunately are still not at a point where we have a perfect vaccine. So let's try to understand where we stand, what are the challenges, what are the successes that we have had so far. So that's really what I'm going to be talking to you about. So leishmaniasis, as I said, is not something that is, you know, currently, uh, it's been there for a long, long time. And in fact, they have found pottery, which has, which has come from Peru and from Ecuador, where as you can see, the nose is disfigured over here which is typical of an individual who is suffering from mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. But it was only in the beginning of the 20th century that the leishmania parasite was identified by uh, William Leishman and Charles Donovan, who were honored together. And so the amastigote form that we see is called the Leishman-Donovan body. So what do we know about this particular disease? We know it is a digenetic parasite which means that it exists within the sandfly vector in the form of promastigotes. And in the form, in the mammalian hosts, it exists as amastigotes. The one who does the job of moving from promastigotes to amastigotes are the sandfly vector, who upon taking a blood meal from their mammalian hosts, as you can see, the mammalian host could be human, could be dogs, could also be rodents. And they would then take up these amastigotes which would then come into the mid-gut of the sandfly, convert into promastigotes. And again, these promastigotes would bite an uninfected individual. And so this vicious cycle is maintained. So mammals are really the intermediate host. And within them, we have involvement of 98 countries worldwide. It's a very widely uh, dispersed disease, as you can see. Probably the only continents that don't have it is probably the Austra is probably Australia and perhaps Antarctica too. But otherwise, every other continent has one form of the disease or not. So that emphasizes the importance of having a vaccine. We are close to be able to controlling the disease, especially in South Asia. But in other places, I think the need for a vaccine is still very strong. So what do we know about these species that are pathogenic for humans? So we have Leishmania donovani, which is responsible for the visceral form of the disease. And in individuals who are apparently cured of visceral leishmaniasis, we have post kalazar dermal leishmaniasis. So kalazar was the original name for the visceral form of the disease. Kala means black and azar means fever. So these individuals presented with hyperpigmentation and they presented with fever. So it's an Indian word. So Kala Azar, from Kala Azar, they found that individuals develop dermal lesions. So that's how we have the term post Kala Azar dermal leishmaniasis or PKDL as we know it. I'll be repeating this word a few times as I go along. So you also have cutaneous leishmaniasis, you have diffuse cutaneous leishmaniasis, and you have mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. 
And these are the pathogens which are uh, involved. So these are really the targets that we have. As I mentioned that to understand whether it is a zoonotic transmission or is it an anthroponotic, it's probably a case of both. Because as you can see, in a number of cases, you have uh, involvement of dogs, involvement of rodents, but you also have involvement of humans. So this is important for a vaccinologist, is if we want to stop the transmission, we need to perhaps prevent the disease from occurring in the, in, in, in the hosts that we have. So perhaps uh, dogs would be a good target to prevent transmission from dogs to humans. So we should have vaccines which are both preventive as also would be a, would also have a curative benefit. So we wouldn't be looking only at a, a vaccine to prevent the disease. We would also be looking at it to perhaps uh, support the drugs, the anti-leach venial drugs and having a therapeutic benefit that we have. So this is really a, a, a glimpse of the different features that you have of the disease. There could be a single lesion, which is a cutaneous lesion. The advantage is this is often a self-healing kind of lesion that occurs. You could also have involvement of the mucosa, in which case it would be a mucocutaneous leishmaniasis. These are much more difficult to treat. Dogs tend to have a visceral form of the disease, so it's canine visceral leishmaniasis. In humans, uh, mainly the important pockets that we have are East Africa, India, as well as Brazil. You have the visceral form of the disease. And even though the individuals are cured of Kalazar, you may have a dermal form of the disease, which is called PKDL, as I mentioned to you. So this really is a spectrum, as I said, as that it's not one single species. So that makes it even more challenging to develop a vaccine against leishmaniasis. We're not just talking about one enemy. We have multiple enemies. And if you look at the diverse clinical variants that you have of cutaneous, Usually the visceral would be just involvement of the liver and spleen. So the individual would come with hepatosplenomegaly. But in cases of the dermal form of the disease, you have a very wide range. You have it, it the spectrum is from a self-healing type of skin ulcer that you have, which is a mild or a severe or a mild or a severe ulcer, which you have. And the other one that we have is a diffuse cutaneous leishmaniasis which is uh, multiple papules and nodules that you can have. The other form is the mucocutaneous leishmaniasis, which is more of a strong inflammatory response. I'll come to the immune response. And the fourth one that we have is the post kalazar or the parakalazar, because in Sudan you have it along with kalazar. So these are the four variants that you have of dermal leishmaniasis. And these are the four against which uh, the vaccines are being targeted. So to understand why do we have such a range of uh, skin lesions, we need to understand really the uh, immunology behind the leishmania life cycle that we have and how does it cause disease. So what tends to happen is you have leishmania is, comes into a marriage. It's a marriage of convenience. I call it a marriage of convenience. It's an alliance where the leishmania parasite decides that I have to make friends with the macrophage. So it makes friends with the macrophage. So this is the macrophage that you have. You have the leishmania parasites entering. Once they enter into the parasite, as we know, the macrophage is actually the first line of defense that we have. So you have to overcome this first line of defense. And that's where they make this pact of you live and I live, we both live together. So how do they do that? They alternatively, they cause alternative activation of the macrophages. And by that, they tune, turn down the activation of macrophages. Usually you have nitric oxide, you have free radicals which are being produced, which would be toxic to the parasite. But here what the macrophages do is they go into a kind of slumber because the, so that the parasites can do. So the parasite does all this and in turn, it also influences the T helper cells to move more towards a Th2 type of response. The Th2 type of response would have IL-4 and IL-10 and TGF beta the two counter-regulatory cytokines, IL-10 and TGF-beta, and much more of the Th1 response, which would actually lead to elimination of the parasite. So you, the, the, thankfully, because for the parasite, because it's a Th2 type of response, you end up having less amount of nitric oxide and peroxynitrite, and so there is parasite persistence. So the leishmania and the macrophage, they live happily ever after, until, of course, we intervene with either a vaccine or a drug. 
So this is a, a sort of a brief overview of the immune response that we have. But as I said, the uh, lesions, the skin lesions that we have, have such a broad range of manifestations. So why does that occur? Because that occurs primarily because what tends to happen is the parasite enters into the macrophage, it converts into an emastigote form. And there what it tends to do is it influences the T-cell responses. So we have four types of T-cell responses that you could have. The four types of T-cell responses you could have is, of course, you have a down regulation. You would have initially what you would have is a strong Th2 type of response. This strong Th2 type of response is going to ensure that you will have the disease. Now, if it is to move towards a self-healing type of disease, then the Th2 will convert into a Th1, and this will help in elimination of the parasite. So this is good news. If you have a self-healing type of, uh, which you do have, uh, the Leishmania major that we have, which occurs in the Middle East, they do have a self-healing type. And this is really what we want from a vaccine to do. We want, this is exactly what we want. So we can learn from nature as to how the self-healing moves from a Th2 to a Th1 type of response. On the other hand, what you have is you could have a non-self-healing type of response, which would be a diffuse cutaneous Leishmaniasis, or you could have a very strong inflammatory response in which there is activation of the Th17 cells, and that would lead to the mucocutaneous type of leishmaniasis that we have. The fourth type that we have is where there is a predominance of the Th2, and along with it, an overwhelming response of the T regulatory cells, which ensures a presence of TGF beta as well as IL-10. And this is what leads, leads to the post kalazar dermal leishmaniasis, which follows from kalazar. So this is in a nutshell, the different types of T cell responses that we have. So you have, so that's how that explains the self healing and right up to the end of post kalazar dermal leishmaniasis, which requires treatment. The self healing does not require treatment, whereas the non self healing do require treatment. So this is really the immunological watersheds that we have of, of, of leishmaniasis. And as you can see over here, you have a prominent Th2 type of response, which you would see which major tropica with all of them. Hi there, Matali seems to have frozen. Can anyone else hear me? Can you type or just say hello? a very interesting time. It occurs in two pockets, which is in Southeast Asia as also in Sudan. So these are the two pockets. And why is it important? It's important because it is considered as the reservoir. It is considered as the disease reservoir for Kalazar because you have these individuals with these skin lesions which are present. You can see the skin lesions which I have indicated by the arrows over here. So all these are absolutely full of parasites. So all the sandfly has to do is come and take one nice uh, uh, blood meal from these individuals and then they would transmit it to uninfected individuals. So, and what tends to happen is these individuals have a very poor health seeking behavior. They would not normally come to seek treatment because for them, these lesions are very innocuous. They are not really in any way uh, fatal. There's only a high morbidity. There is zero mortality. And therefore, because of their poor treatment seeking behavior, this disease reservoir remains a mobile disease reservoir. So it's very important that we actually uh, address this thing. And that is what uh, Mohammed will be talking about, about the vaccines that we have, uh, that they have developed for PKDL. So PKDL, again, is if we are able to eliminate PKDL, either by a prophylactic vaccine or by a therapeutic vaccine, we would then have a success story as far as elimination of VL uh, Akalazar is concerned. So that is really what the aim of the elimination program is, which is ongoing in India, Bangladesh and Nepal, is to eliminate Kalazar from Southeast Asia. And that is really the goal that we have. We haven't had success story. It hasn't been a complete success story, but we are very close to elimination. And by 2020, the goal of reaching less than one case per 10,000 in a block is almost there in a number. Nepal has already achieved it. 
Bangladesh has also achieved it. India is close to be able to achieve it. So we have a dramatic reduction in the number of cases in Southeast Asia. And the last mile challenge is really is the identification, early identification of these cases of PKDL because we need to eliminate the transmitter. And it, is, it has been established quite clearly that PKDLs are the transmitters for the disease. So what are the current strategies that we have for reducing leishmaniasis? We mainly have vector control and chemotherapy, but they're not the best. Chemotherapy is not very good because it's a very limited therapeutic uh, armamentarium that we have. We have just about two, three drugs. There is always a problem with the concern for drug resistance developing. They are expensive. Liposomal amphotericine B is an excellent drug, but you need to give it, it has to be given intravenously, so it is difficult to administer. So there is a need for having a vaccine or having better chemotherapy. So vaccines will probably have a more long-term, long, long-term benefit. Uh, Blakely, you'll have to tell me close to when, uh, when it's close to my time being over. So from there, so if we learn from history and we go back in time, if we go back in time, we can learn lessons from variolation, which was used for eradication of smallpox. So here is a, a wife of the Raja of Mysore who volunteered to agree to uh, getting a small amount of the smallpox attenuated vaccine because she needed to encourage and be a role model for others to take this vaccine to be able to do it. And as we know, smallpox is completely eradicated. Jenner, of course, was a little more brave and he possibly was one of the first to do what we now call the controlled human infection model. It was extremely brave. I'm not sure it would have crossed the ethics committees of most, most ethics committees would probably not have given it a clearance but that's another story in itself. So these were indications where we were able to identify that if you gave an attenuated form of the bug, of, of whatever it may be, whether it's a parasite or whether it's a virus, you would be able to induce immunity. So the same principle has been applied for leishmanization where a certain amount of the parasite is inoculated directly into the skin and it has been found to produce some amount of partial protection has been done and we'll talk about it. So there is an urgent need for a safe and effective vaccine against leishmaniasis. And this is really, it's the safety which takes up a lot of the time because we're going to be giving it to healthy individuals. Effectiveness often uh, gets tested and is quite robust, but it's really the safety concerns that one has. So what is the advantage that we have? The advantage that we have is when we know that natural infections of cutaneous and the visceral form, they cause lifelong immunity. So this is really good. This is good news as far as vaccines are concerned, that you have lifelong immunity. So we need to identify what are those immunogenic, uh, uh, immunogenic epitopes that we have. If we can identify them, we can actually uh, simulate the scenario that is there with natural infections. There is a lot of work which is going on with regard to the whole parasite vaccines, they have of course tried to develop a different, this is a different range that we have. You have live active, you have live attenuated, you have live non-pathogenic vaccines, some of which were uh, physically attenuated by ultraviolet uh, radiation, ultravirus radi UV radiation. You had chemical attenuation. We then have the second generation has genetically modified vaccines. And we are now at the point of uh, third generation vaccines, which are uh, which have genetically modified non-pathogenic uh, non-pathogenic uh, uh, parasites. So we have a whole range, and it's really the vaccine story goes back a long, long way. And it's not that we haven't had success, but the success that we would want, we haven't had that degree of success yet. So leishmanization has been around for a long, long time. It involves deliberate inoculation into skin of infective and virulent leishmania. So this is the part which is a little, little uh, sticky, I would say, because you're injecting infective and virulent parasites, which are taken from the exudate of a lesion, which is usually a, a self-healing cutaneous leishmaniasis caused by leishmania major. In fact, it is licensed in Uzbekistan 
but it has been found that leishmanization doesn't come, uh, it has its uh, quota of uh, disadvantages, which involve, it has been seen, that there is a high proportion of immunosuppression. They found that they, these children who were being uh, leash, uh, who were undergoing leishmanization had low responses to the diphtheria pertussis tetanus vaccine. Some of them, unfortunately, a very small percentage, probably five, two to five percent, had a uh, flaring up of the, uh, had lesions which appeared, which were quite, which were uncontrolled, and they stayed. The scar remained. The inoculum quality control was difficult to do, but I think we could actually revisit this approach with the new technology that we have, and we could actually consider doing this because it was something which is feasible on a long-term basis for uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis. So how do we use bugs as drugs? We can, and we have. It is an excellent form of immunotherapy that you have. There has been success in mucocutaneous leishmaniasis and diffuse cutaneous leishmaniasis. It has not been able to completely treat the disease, but there have been, the symptoms have definitely been less. The scars are certainly less. So in that sense, uh, these vaccines have worked. For cutaneous, uh, for, for canine visceral leishmaniasis, you have, there have been two which have already been licensed, which are canny leash and leash mule. They have been used for vaccination of dogs. So this is uh, how things stand at the moment. If we look at the leishmania vaccines, we began with the first generation of vaccines, which were killed parasite vaccines. Then we moved towards attenuated form of the vaccine. Then a certain fraction of it was taken. These had the disadvantages that because they were killed and live attenuated, there was always a concern of flaring up of the disease. Then uh, vaccinologists moved to the second generation where they identified immunogenic epitopes. From the immunogenic epitopes, they made the cocktail vaccines. These then moved towards uh, the DNA vaccines and the chimeric vaccines. So essentially what you need is you need to have know which are the antigens that are going to work and which adjuvants which help will help you to initiate and also direct the immune response. So some of these are the, some of the examples that we have of the first generation. As you can see, majority of them are essentially killed promastigotes, which have, which have either been by pasteurization or simply by just autoclaving them. Some were even live attenuated. And the one that we have, which is done, so in terms of those which have reached the stage of clinical trials, the stage of clinical trials has been achieved by three of them, the leash vaccine, the leash mune, and the canny leash. These have entered into phase three trials. So these are vaccines which have helped to reduce the symptoms of cutaneous leishmaniasis and have also helped in reducing the transmission in cases in, in, in vaccinating dogs that we have. So in terms of the second generation vaccines that we have, this was really recombinant technology which came to our benefit. And you can see over here, we have a number of vaccines. I've spoken about those which have moved into clinical trials, a number of them. If you go into the, if you do a PubMed search, uh, you'll be really lost in this world of vaccines. There are so many studies which are going on. Many, many uh, good uh, vaccine candidates have been identified, but I focused mainly on those which have entered into clinical trials. And th these include Leash F1, F2, and F3. There were minor differences uh, between them. Uh, Leash Tech has also entered into clinical trials. It has entered into the third phase. It is made up of the emastigote uh, antigen, the A2 protein. The kinetoplastid encoding membrane protein has been used in phase three, it has been used in the third generation vaccine. And so you also have an antigen cocktail vaccine, which comprises of a number of antigens. So what they realized was that if they use a combination of antigens, they would be able to induce a good immune response. So these are the vaccines. You can see Leash Tech has entered into phase three. And the, there's only one which has entered into phase two, but a number of them are still in phase one. So we really haven't done very well, simply because the problems we have had is that we haven't been able to get inadequate uh, adequate number of a memory B cell response, inadequate Th1 uh, immune responses. The efficacy hasn't been very good. From a safety point of view, we've done reasonably well. 
But the main problem has been is that the immune response, the immunogenicity is good, but in terms of time, it is not a, it, we, we still don't know how good it is. It's not very long-term benefits. I mean, if we think about the COVID vaccine that we have, we here too in the COVID vaccines, we don't know how good is the long-term immunogenicity of, of the COVID vaccines. We will only know it in time. But uh, since the Leishmania vaccines have been around for a much longer time, we do know that we need to develop vaccines which can have a much longer uh, protection. The degree of protection, the degree and the length of protection has to be much longer. In terms of the Leishmania examples of the third generation vaccine that we have, these are some of the three, third generation vaccines that we have. And we will have Muhammad talking to us about uh, number six, where they have been able to elicit the response. They have been able to identify CD8 T cells. And the main difference was between the second generation and the third generation was a much stronger T cell response was being achieved by both by changing the vector as also by changing the antigen. So if we look uh, at all the ones that have entered into clinical trials, and we look at the mechanism of action. We won't go into details of it. Uh, Blakely, can you tell me how much time I still have? Um, it'd be nice to wrap up in the next five minutes. <laughs> okay, great. So the vaccines that we have is essentially, these are the vaccines that we have. And if you look at all of them, they're all of course targeted at T-cell activation. And if you look at the most important outcome that we have is a majority of them have been protective but uh, they have shown a decrease in the incidence, not complete healing. So it's used for the non-healing form. There's a decrease in the incidence. There's a protection level, but it's not a 100% success story. So a high degree of protection has been achieved. And what we would like is a much stronger uh, induction of immunity. The safety nightmares, of course, are there. There is always the risk of disease exacerbation. There is always the probability of pathological reactions. There is always the problem that we have uh, is that these attenuated organisms may cause disease in immunocompromised individuals, which is important in tropical countries because individuals, there may be malnourishment, may be a coexisting problem. And individuals who have malnourishment, they would have a lower immunocompetence. So their immunosuppression may make vaccination a uh, difficult issue. So these would need to be tested at site. Uh, so usually safety studies are done on healthy volunteers, but these would need to be done in healthy volunteers in the country of choice, keeping in mind the problem of malnourishment. So what are we aiming for in a good vaccine? Of course, it goes without saying that we would require a good immune protection, especially a robust TH1 response. We definitely would require global participation, and that's where the Validate Network can play a very important role. And for those of you who do not work in the Leishmania vaccine uh, area, your skills in the Leishmania vaccine area may come in very handy, because uh, as we have realized that Leishmania is not just one disease, it is a spectrum of diseases. So one size does not fit all. Definitely financial support is required. And it goes without saying that a neglected tropical disease like Leishmania should definitely not remain neglected. There is a need for volunteers. This is important because we are now at a point where visceral leishmaniasis has achieved the goal of elimination. So will we get enough volunteers for this? This is a concern that we would have for being when we test for a PKDL vaccine. Encourage animal vaccination as it can reduce a disease burden in the human population. So this is in terms of the vaccination. This is really in a nutshell, what we would require for a good vaccine. I would not have been able to make this presentation had I not had the excellent support, which was provided by my research fellow, Deep Goswami, who actually put together all this information. I don't directly work on vaccines. So I was able to, so I have addressed the challenges that are there in terms of vaccines. So he put together everything and I now leave it to my next speaker, Dr. Mohammed Osman, who will take over and take us through a journey, which is a hands-on journey that he has with regard to uh, Leishmania vaccine. So Mohammed uh, was born in Sudan. 
He was educated. His primary and secondary education was in Sudan. He then moved to Egypt to do his bachelor's and then came to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine to do his master's and thereafter his PhD from Queen's University. His, work, his postdoctoral experience has been on vaccine development against cytomegalovirus. And he is presently a senior immunologist working in the uh, Leishmania vaccine uh, group, which is headed by Paul Kay at the University of York. And he is also a visiting professor at the University of Khartoum at the Institute of Endemic Diseases in, in, in Sudan. So I'll hand over to Mohammed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there are any questions, I suggest that we could take it after Mohammed's uh, talk, if that's okay with everybody. So Mohammed, it's over to you. I will stop okay. my sharing. Thank you very much, Metali, for this introduction. Okay. Let me stop um, the sharing and yes. move on. Yeah. Yes. Okay, let me share my slide there. Okay. Happy to receive questions. There we go. Is that okay? Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and invitation. I'm very honor to be uh, to give a talk in this uh, excellent platform. Uh, what I'm going to talk today about uh, our effort in vaccine development against leishmaniasis. Uh, I think you, you will agree with me this is a golden era of the vaccines and we just heard from different tests from Italy about the smallpox and uh, COVID-19. In 1972 the smallpox is been eradicated by use of the vaccine, and we're just uh, enjoying the vaccine developed uh, for COVID-19. And although the technology which are used are different in terms of a smallpox, uh, this is a life attenuated vaccine, modified vaccine virus, and here we use have uh, adenovirus vector. But the end that we, we have a successful uh, vaccine for both of them. And I think that is a good booster for us who work on the vaccines. So uh, I'm going to talk about our vaccine. In a sense, this is a vaccine. I'm going to talk about phase one and phase two, just to give overview, but I will go into details. We're using adenovirus vector, and these are two antigens which we are using, KMP and HASP. We use single dose intramuscular, and we test them phase one and phase two in PKDL uh, patient. We look at the safety of the vaccine, and we look at the immunology of the vaccine. Uh, the rationale for developing the vaccine is obvious. Uh, still, there is a disease associated with visceral leishmaniasis, over 70,000 per year. Uh, there is a drug, however, there is the emergence of drug resistance, and the drug itself is toxic. No effective vaccine, as we heard earlier, and most of the current vaccine induced uh, targets CD8 T cell. Originally, when we initial our initial work, we wanted to uh, design our vaccine to induce or reactivate CD8 T cell uh, and use it as a therapeutic vaccine. However, what we now know that the vaccine induced in post broad immune response for CD4 and CD8 and B cell response, now we're shifting our emphasis just not using for therapeutic vaccine, but using as a, a prophylactic vaccine as well. So I just move this one out of my way. This one, I guess. So, so I just can't remove this one. This is on my way, sorry. Uh, so what is need for uh, for therapeutic vaccine? Uh, we we just heard that Leishmania can cause a spectrum of disease, especially uh, Leishmania donovani. It can cause visceral leishmaniasis, it can cause picadil, and it can cause subclinic as well. So what we need to do for with our vaccine, whether we can treat, this is a therapeutic vaccine, whether we can treat P, uh, VL or 
where we can treat PKDL. If we treat PKDL, we do in favor for the individual who are, who are infected. But at the same time, as Mitali said, this spots and lesions are full of parasites. So we, are, we can prevent spreading of the disease for others. If we can treat subclinical as well, so we are preventing this individual from developing into VL. So the benefit of therapeutic vaccine will be reduced drug uses, reduce cost, uh, the cost of hospitalization and the emergency of drug resistance. So what is our vaccine made of? Uh, this is an antigen which we are working on. So this is KMP11 uh, and we use has protein. And these are linked with this viral derived synthetic peptides here. So the KMP11 is conserved in all Lishmania species. And what we find is rich in CD8 T cell response. The Has protein is uh, conserved in terms of N terminal and C terminal. However, we have this unique repeat, uh, amino acid repeat in the middle. And these repeats are different in different clinical isolates. So we collected different repeats and made a synthetic protein out of, uh, for Has protein. And we linked this two protein with two TA, which is derived from the virus. And the idea is that when this protein uh, expressed in the cell, this virus, this TA will add the cleavage of this protein and they will become independently expressed. So, so the protein here, this is the vaccine. Uh, we find it, there's no homology to human protein so that is another safety aspect and it does not have any biological activity towards human cells and it's been shown to recognize by immune response and post antigen can be used as a subunit so with the delivery system we chosen to work on seven adenovirus charge 63 which we'll call this one and this is virus adenovirus have shown to be immunogenic and strong inducer of CD8 T cell response. And it has a history of inducing long-term immunity and it has a good safety. So, so we, we, we opt to use adenovirus as a delivery system. So we started our uh, phase one clinical trial in, the, in, in, in healthy volunteers. And this is uh, done in, at York University. This is uh, the this study design is over labeled and we recruited 20 uh, volunteers and we're looking for their immunogenicity and safety in this individual. I'll try to get to the next slide. Yes, so that's the uh, design of the uh, trial. We have, uh, uh, this is phase one clinical trial. We recruited 20 uh, individual, it's a single dose. We started with low dose for five, five volunteers. And the idea with that one is that to check the safety of the vaccine uh, before we go to the high dose. So once we confirmed this was safe in the five individuals with the low dose, we moved to a higher dose. And we follow this individual vaccine for over 90 days. And we're looking for uh, cytokine and interferon gamma at this spot. And we're doing transcriptomics on them as well. So, so we made a synthetic peptide which cover uh, all the peptide, uh, all the, the whole protein, can be and has protein. We made different pools of the peptide. We made CD8 T cell peptide pools, which will cover uh, the whole KMB and Levin. And we made six pools of that one. Each contain about 36 uh, peptides. We made CD4 and CD8 peptide pools, which we call pool A and pool B e and pool C. And this is a uh, 15 meter peptide. So it's going to recognize uh, by CD4 and CD8 as well. How do we measure the immunogenicity of the vaccine? We get blood from the donors and we get white, extract white blood cells. And in vitro, we stimulate PBMCs and to look for interferon gamma and spot, or we look for intracellular cytokine. 
Similarly, we look for transcriptomic early after a few days uh, post vaccination to look at the innate immune response. So, to look at the immunogenicity, we done both CD8 and CD4 and CD8 T response. We measured both of them uh, using early spot, and this is a representative of our uh, volunteers. We find induction of CD8 T cells, which is peaks at day 28 and then goes down. Uh, what is nice thing about this one, our immune system can last to up uh, to nine days in this individual. Similarly, we find uh, immune responses against uh, for CD4 and CD8 T cells. So that is just a representative of our work and we published that one. Uh, we looked at the functionality uh, of the uh, CD8 T cells, which induced by the uh, vaccine, and because polyfunction is important for uh, for, uh, good quality of CD8 T cells, and indeed we find different combinations. So we're looking at combination of uh, interferon gamma, TNF, and IL2, and uh, the, the vaccine can able to produce polyfunctional, uh, uh, multifunctional uh, CD8 T cells. Uh, in terms of safety, the vaccine is safe. Uh, it's only minor side effects, which is are common for other vaccines as well, is redness and swelling as a side of the infection and systematically is a little bit of headache which lasts for one or two days so the vaccine which we have is 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 safe as well there's no severe uh, side effect to summarize phase one clinical trial so what we find there's no serious adverse event reported and both of those can be and hasp are immunogenic at both low and high uh, uh, doses. So what was the success of phase one clinical trial? Uh, we got funding from Welcome Trust who trusted us to continue and do this as a phase two clinical trial in the endemic area. So we're using the same vaccine which I just described for uh, phase two uh, in, in Sudan. I uh, just made earlier to explain to you the BKDL disease. It comes in different grades, grade one and grade two and grade three, according to the distribution and intensity of the lesion. So grade one will be on the face, grade two will be face and chest, and grade three will be whole body. So we decided to work on BKDL diseases because this could be a valuable target. It's benefiting the individual and the community itself. And there is no animal model for BKDL. The nice thing about BKDL is chronic, but it's not life threatening. So you can leave the patient for a longer period of time to see the end product. And the clinical end points is very defined whether uh, this lesion will disappear. So you can clinically look if there is an improvement. The side which we use and to wear on is the eastern part of Sudan in Gadarek. They have excellent uh, facilities there and it's very regulated environment. And uh, this is a team in, in Gadarif. So this is Paul and Becky and Musa and others. Uh, so, so, so the team, we have a core facility with a clinician and scientist. But what I want to say is important for this setting, a guy such, such a uh, guy such like Abdul Karim, for example, he's not a scientist, but he's very important for the success of this type of clinical trial because he's he's a local, he's a local person who can go in the field, in the muddy field, and recruit the patient for uh, uh, this study. And these are a very important individual to be incorporated in the team if you want to do this type of study. Uh, the study design, this is phase 2A, is a single dose over level and non-randomized. We're using the same vaccine, as I said, that we want to assess the safety in BKDL patients, although we confirm the uh, uh, safety of the vaccine in UK, but we want to see whether it's the vaccine is safe in BKDL patients. We want to see the immunogenicity. And third, we want to see if there is efficacy, if the improvement is using the vaccine. Uh, we recruited 24 individual BKDL patients. Uh, there are two adults here, adult group, adult, which receive low dose of the vaccine, and adult as well, 
a high dose of the vaccine and adolescent which receive a high dose of the vaccine. In each of these groups, we have eight patients. And once they have the vaccine injection, they will stay in the center for one week for clinical observation and safety. And after that, they will go and we will follow up over to 90 days. And luckily, all of them, they complete in the follow up. So I go through the demographics of these individuals. If you look at the male female ratio, uh, in, uh, in total, we have a uh, dominant here of uh, 21 uh, male and three female. Uh, or, or, although the disease is equal in terms of infecting girls and boys, but however, I think for logistic reason and recruitment, we're getting a uh, dominance of, of male who can stay for period for longer period of time in, in the center. Uh, the age between 18, between 14 and 23. Uh, and interestingly, the PKDL uh, duration is up to 30 months. So it's gone from zero, from normally from six months up to oh, 30 months. So it's a longer persistent type of disease which we can monitor uh, uh, the efficacy of the vaccine. Uh, we done the safety after vaccination for this. So the safety record is, is very good and excellent. Uh, it's only some sort of itching and pain at the side of uh, immunization and injection and a little bit of headache, which is common. Uh, what This is what we've seen in New York in phase one clinical trial. And this is the same spectrum which we see with other type of vaccine as well. So to this end, the vaccine is safe in PKDL uh, patients. This slide is important, which is uh, address the clinical outcome of the vaccine. Uh, here we have low dose adult. Uh, in each of them, we have eight individual. Here, what we are measuring here, the initial disease percentage. Each one, when a patient comes to the follow up, we take a photo of it. And they assign this is 100 at the initial before the vaccine, this is 100% disease. And then we follow that over a period of time if there is improvement. The dotted line here will, uh, this is a 90% improvement of the patient. And interestingly, we find these two individuals, they responded very well and they uh, gave over 90% uh, improvement in their lesion. Uh, some of them they gave 30 and 40, but some others they needed treatment. They start here when you saw these are treatments. So the protocol say if you find, uh, so the, the intention is for treatment. If they need the treatment, we will treat them at this time. But uh, in low adults, we have these two individuals responded and two others with improvement with 30 to 40 percent. Uh, interesting, one of these people who are uh, responded, they are grade C, uh, grade three uh, of the uh, PKDL. In high dose, again, we have three individuals responded very, very well, and they uh, gave uh, over 90% uh, response to this one. However, the rest is treated treatment. High dose as well, we have two individuals who responded uh, or recover or give a good uh, clinical outcome improvement in this setting. Uh, we looked at the whole uh, blood transcriptomics. We looked at uh, in, in those three groups, adult low dose and adult high dose and adolescents. Uh, this is pre-vaccination and one day and three days and seven days after the vaccination. So I just, uh, because this is long list of modules, over 50, you're not able to read, but I have summarized them here in this list. So what we find is we find a number of module, module upregulated in, in post-adult and adults, And these are mainly interferon, gamma, or, or antiviral associated modules, modules. And each module contain about 10 to 15 genes. I highlight this one red. Uh, this enriched in B cells, and that was only feasible in these adolescents. So we couldn't find upregulation in, in adult, but in adoles uh, adolescent, we find enrichment in, in B cells, and we would like to investigate that further. So, in terms of immune response, it's very comparable. 
uh, to what we found in, in leash one and leash two, so that we have a good immune response, both for CD4 and CD. This is a CD8 response. Um, in, or in the three groups, we have a good immune response, interferon gamma responses as well. And you can see that uh, the interferon gamma responses, the vaccine induced uh, uh, after vaccination, good, good number of interferon gamma response. Per, uh, per million cells. So in that sense, the, the vaccine is immunogenic and induce very good CD8 T cell response. To summarize this part, what we show in that in phase uh, 11, uh, sorry, two a the vaccine show minimal and it's safe, minimal adverse effect and it's safe and induce potent uh, innate and cell mediate response. We found seven out of 23 patients. Uh, this is 30 patients gave us a good, uh, uh, showed uh, over 90% of clinic, uh, clinical improvement. And we get five out of 21%, so partial improvement. So this one encouraged the results which we got, encouraged to go further to do phase 2B because we want to know whether this improvement is actually due to the vaccine or not. So this is why we designed the phase 2B experiment to look again at the safety and efficacy and to see the... Uh, so what we've done is, is this design in a different way. So this is randomized, double-blinded, a placebo controlled. Uh, for this one, we're planning to recruit uh, 100 participants, which will be randomly assigned either 50% uh, 50, percent, uh, 50 individual will be received placebo and 50 will receive uh, the vaccine. And we follow them over 120 days. Uh, the objective will be to measure the immune response and cellular humor and its uh, cellular response. And we see if there is a, a clinical change after the vaccine. So far, uh, this study is going on. We have recruited six, uh, 68 uh, patients to, to the study. So hopefully we'll report that maybe early next year. So, so far I spoke about the vaccine testing in endemic area, but what we're planning to do or doing now is to, to develop a human uh, infection model using Lishmania major infected cells. This is a century old methodology which people use, uh, sand fly infected and transferred to human, but we're developing that in York as well. And we already done that. The idea here is whether if we develop this method, can we test the vaccine rapidly and, and look at the pathogenesis rather than going to endemic area at the beginning, which is a huge challenge, but in a controlled environment, if we have this matter, we can test our vaccine. So far, what we've done, we collected sand fly and we infected, so it's an uninfected sand fly, but we wanted to see whether the sand fly can take blood uh, meal from our uh, volunteers. And you can see here the sand fly, if you can see the red here, this vaccine is red, so that is a blood meal. Uh, taken by this uh, sand fly, but here this sand fly failed to take the uh, blood meal. So what we're doing now is uh, to get infected sand fly and challenge our volunteers and see whether they develop a lesion or not. And that is ongoing. So what I learned, lesson learned from this study, I think it is important uh, for this time of study to, to, to have a common goal in a team which have a common goal and vision and passion about what you do. It is, it is important to have a, a complementary skill set and strengths. And I mentioned the soft skills uh, which come from Abdul Karim who can go to the field and recruit individuals. So, and I think these type of skills uh, are needed and very important. It's, it's important to have a clear partner role and responsibility uh, it's, it's important as well to have respect of each other. Uh, doing this, this type of collaboration, you, you met people with similar aims and you start a new project. And I think validate platform, I think it is a good way to start as well. So I, 
this is the last slide, which I'd like to uh, acknowledge people who contributed and initiated the work, Paul K and Charles Alleston, and all the lists. There's some of some of these individuals, they are directly involved with the vaccine work, and some of them, they are do some related to the vaccine. And this work done at York and in Sudan in endemic uh, school. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Mohammed. I think that was a lovely talk. And you ended on a very positive note with the controlled human infection model. So we look forward to the next series will probably be how your uh, model can actually be used. And I think it's, it's very nice. I can see a few hands up. So uh, Adelada, are you are you there? Yes, yes, please, here. please go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Mohammed, thank you so much for the interesting talk and also you, Mitali, for all the introduction and the analysis. Um, and first of all, excuse the very maybe naive question, but I would like to understand how it works. So you are introducing Leishmania antigens to people that are already infected and that they have actually a flare up of of uh, cutaneous disease. So why is the native antigen, let's say, not working in those people if you show that it actually works after you reintroduce it? Yes, uh, is that for, uh, I will answer that one. I, th I think this is a very interesting question. And I think it's, uh, this is uh, cryptic epitopes, actually. Most of this, uh, in the natural infection, these peptides, they do not produce good immune response. And that is uh, some sort of theme here, even for malaria, if you look at the Simon Square, and the antigen which they use is not naturally uh, recognized by the immune response. But when they use it as an antigen and vaccine, they use it. So what we have is, is a cryptic type of epitome. And normally somehow the leishmania or, or all the parasites, most of the parasites, they direct and the full the immune system through some different antigen, which we always uh, detect uh, when we do the assay. But this one are cryptic, and this why we want to reactivate this one and induce it, hopefully, with the idea of protection. But that is a good question, and this is what uh, the, the philosophy and idea behind that one. Cool. Thank you so much. So we, we should look then for things that are not originally immunogenic. Uh, absolutely, and, uh, and I think so, because those are obvious antigens, uh, the, the, they might not be protective. And so when you look at the antigen, which are not recognized easily, these are the, uh, the good antigen, in my opinion, and this is why the leishmania hides them from the immune system. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a nice way to approach it. You know, you think that, that, that the ones that are immunogenic, but I think considering the amount of research that has gone on with Leishmania vaccines, we've kind of gone through the whole gamut. So I think we need to kind of change our strategy. Hiro, uh, over to you, please. Yes. Hi, Mitali. Hi, Mohammed. Hi. Uh, very, very nice talk. And uh, uh, for us, uh, PKGL is a uh, a uh, very interesting disease, interesting, uh, let's say, because it's a, uh, we don't have here in Brazil and it's a uh, very challenging and it's um, uh, very happy that you are getting some uh, results with this uh, vaccine. But uh, one thing that we are doing in, we are uh, running some basic uh, research uh, and uh, we have in Brazil different uh, species of leishmania from uh, uh, some of uh, uh, Viania uh, uh, subgenerals, other leishmania. And we note that the metabolism of these uh, species are quite different. And we are uh, focusing the leishmania infantum uh, metabolomic. And we see that the uh, uh, source for the polyamines uh, are seemingly is very different. We are going to, so uh, uh, that's why some of the results uh, with uh, 
I O four interferon gamma in Leishman and Phantom. It's uh, very different to compare with uh, Leishman and Major, uh, for example. So I think that the, one of the problem of this uh, the this uh, candidate vaccine that are are, are uh, based on the this uh, uh, response to, to induce interferon gamma and uh, CG8 cells, CG8, uh, CG4, CG8 cells. But uh, uh, I think that to have a, a better vaccine, we have to understand better the metabolism of this uh, Leishmania species. So, because I think that we, we cannot uh, base on the re immune response based on interferon gamma, only to develop this. I think one of the problems that if you compare the, this uh, uh, new uh, vaccines, that uh, new generation vaccines compared to leishmanization, one of the problems is that we are not to uh, understand the biology of the leishman. This is one thing that we, we, we not seen this. But anyway, it's a uh, very, uh, happy to see the progress in this uh, uh, PKDL uh, research. And uh, one uh, few note uh, on the reservoir of Leishmania brasiliensis, uh, Mitali showed in the table the dog, but the dog is not the reservoir. This is one of the difficult part. For Leishmania brasiliensis, we actually, oh, the uh, data, are not so strong, but uh, reservoir some marsupials and rodent, and some are described as horse. But the dog is not uh, definitely is not the reservoir for Leishmania brasiliensis. What makes the control more complicated? Exactly, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. really one size does not fit all. You cannot yeah. use it. even the the PKDL that we have, the PKD uh -huh. of Sudan is very mm -hmm. different from the PKDL which you see in, in Southeast Asia. In PKDL, which is why he uh, Muhammad said that there was 31% protection, but they need to see whether it was spontaneous healing or whether it was whether it was the vaccine which had actually helped. So whereas in India, we don't have any spontaneous healing at all. So you really, you know, you often, you, you know, even though we both work on, you know, we all work on different Lishpenia species, I think the take home message is that we need to cross talk with each other, because that's the only way that we can actually take things forward. Thank you, Hero. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Pijush, you had a question? Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Dalian, Dr. Osman. Thanks for a very wonderful talk and it's very informative. So I'm a new faculty at KMC Manipal in India. So I'm, I again have a naive question that's related to my project actually. So I work in Burkhold area and we are starting a vaccine development kind of project here. So do you have any suggestion like how should we start? So like for, start, for finding a good epitope or antigenic marker, is there any software that we should focus on or should we go like a conventional method for heat killed bacteria in injecting into mice or like any suggestion in this regard? I, I think that's a very important and very challenging question. And I think searching the right, uh, finding the right protective uh, uh, antigen, it, it, it's not easy, especially if you are working with the parasites which uh, in code for 80,000 proteins. Uh, it's not like a virus COVID, you have a very limited number of uh, uh, protein and you know which one is immunogenic, so you can uh, target the spike protein and that will neutralize. But if you work with the Leishmania or so this, uh, or others, parasites which have uh, hundreds of protein, it's very challenging. Uh, maybe the best start is to use, uh, to use reverse uh, genetic uh, approach. So you, you need to clone all of them or most or pull a lot of genes together and test them. Uh, because uh, as we have seen this, even if you look at the uh, immunoproteomic, uh, maybe the protective one will be cryptic. So it will not show up in the in, in your serum or in your cellular assay. So I think it's, uh, uh, it's a big task. 
but it's very important to do and it's not easy and this is why we don't have a lot of uh, protective antigen in the market so so you have to maybe oh, reverse okay. genetic a uh, cocktail of a cocktail of antigens yeah, exactly so you, a cocktail of antigens and then from there you know then after that kind of identify which are the more immunogenic ones that would be and you do have bioinformatics there are a lot of immunoinformatics which you could also access but i think that would be like to begin with probably that would be the the, the good approach so uh, if i can move to the questions that are there in the chat box i think there are some very interesting questions so margaret nolan had a question that she noted that all the uh, the photographs uh, mohammed that you had uh, of pkdl lesions were primarily on the face so she asked a very valid question do you think that sun exposure considering that sudan is right at the equator has anything to do with the development of pkdl or do the lesions also appear elsewhere do you think that exposure to sun actually facilitates uh, pkdl or do you think that it's i, I think it's a combination of uh, many things one is the environment and one is the parasite itself and maybe one is uh, the third one is, is the genetics as well uh, 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 but I think there's a lot of work shown that uh, actually the sun play important role, and and I th you rightly say that is the the, ex the exposed part of the body, which is actually where the uh, maybe you can say okay that is exposed to the sun, but you can easily say that exposed to the sun fly as well, because the rest of the body is covered, so maybe it's not accessible uh, to 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 the sun fly to have the point. But but uh, there, there's so many core factors. Metal, you can say about your four factor. You think vitamin D would have a facilitatory role? You know, these are more areas: the face and you know the back and everything. But was you as you say that uh, it's also it's 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 probably both. The sandfly has more access to to the face, but then the sandfly also has access to to hands and 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 other places also. But I think it's it's a very interesting question and it is, something it is, it is, worth it is, it is. worth worth taking forward. So uh, the other question that was there is uh, you you answered uh, Pijush's question. Uh, Raiko had a question which says uh, he wants to know the preclinical evidence. What was the preclinical evidence for the uh, vaccine that you you developed? And when you did the immune response analysis and the transcriptomics. Did the two individuals that responded particularly well, did they stand out in any way? This was a question that I also had, that you had clearly two of them in both groups, the low dose as well as the high dose, who mm -hmm. clearly there was response. So if you did their transcriptomics, did it differ from that of the transcriptomics of the other? Yes, regarding pre-clinical, we done pre-clinical studies in, in, in mice as well, uh, uh, and that we, we published that early on, so that is show over 70% reduction in, in parasite load. Uh, regarding the transcriptomics, we done the transcriptomic early uh, after one or two, uh, after one and two or three days after immunization, uh, vaccination, and I, I, we were not able to predict. Uh, what we done is it was not uh, able to predict uh, which one will respond and maybe because of the low number which we have and maybe if we increase the number and we are repeating that one in phase uh, 2b so we may able to 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 do that one but at this stage uh, it's, it's hard to tell but it, it is a very good question whether we are able to predict who is going to respond and who is not going to respond. But uh, we're still doing a lot of bioinformatics on them. So uh, phase two B will be will be interesting. Yes, uh, because first yes, because that is more individual. Uh, we have uh, one hundred so, of them, so that will be. Ashraf had another question for you, Mohammed. Mm -hmm. uh, which antigen is inducing the CD4 cell responses in the PKDL vaccine that uh, you have tested? Uh, both of them, KMB and HASP, both of them, they are inducing. Uh, okay. for, for HASP, uh, the N-terminal and C-terminal, they produce, they have immunodominant uh, peptides for CD4 and CD8 and KMB11 as well. So that both antigen, they are able to produce CD4 and CD8 T-cells. Yeah. Rupal had a question. Rupal, has your, your hand is up. Rupal Oja, would you like to? Uh, and, uh, Dr. Uh, 
so my question is uh, regarding the vaccine like uh, little uh, louder please uh, hello am i audible little louder hello hello yeah go ahead yeah so uh, good evening uh, my question is uh, regarding the vaccine development uh, like for the leishmania suppose uh, we have designed a multi epitope vaccine and uh, uh, what is the pro what will be the procedure to check the vaccine in in vitro condition like for animal model everyone go for the animal model uh, to check the efficacy and safety of the vaccine but what will be the process for the in vitro validation like first we have to challenge the cells with the vaccine or uh, uh, after challenging the cell so this is my question yeah i, I think in vitro what you only you can do is look at whether they are immune response so you can get uh, uh, in vitro you got get pbmcs from uh, uh, infected individual uh, who are have active disease and you can get the pbmc from those who are recovered as well and if you can compare both of them uh, we expect that those people who recover from the infection have the good immunity and maybe the protein which you are testing we will have some sort of uh, immune response from these individuals. So I think in that said, you, you need to compare different spectrum of patients. Some people who are actually infected ongoing disease, some people who are uh, recovered uh, and then test in vitro, whether you use uh, interferon gamma and spot or killing or uh, different cytokines. I hope that answers. Uh, we can uh, like uh, validate the site, we can check the cytokine profiling on the cells. Yes, you, you can look for different cytokines, yeah. Uh, the, the easiest West, uh, best, uh, cytokine, which everybody used for monitoring vaccine is interferon gamma and spot, because that's the reproducer and the golden standard for uh, uh, for monitoring the vaccine. Uh, that doesn't mean, mean that the interferon gamma is, is important, and the other cytokines are less important, but that is a, a biomarker for vaccine-induced responses. You have one more question, Mohammed. See, obviously, your talk has got everybody thinking. So there's Shyam Chatterjee who wants to know whether your vaccine uh, would also be could be used as a prophylactic vaccine. Yes, uh, yeah, I think that's what we, we want to do because the, what is shown now from uh, other studies on adenovirus, it can induce broader and spectrum immune response to uh, CD4 and CD8 and antibodies. And what we're trying to do is to move the vaccine to prophylactic vaccine. And we hope to, to, to do that one as well. We do start our preclinical animal model and hopefully we move with that one into, in, into the patient. But definitely that's what we hope to do. So that would be given to a, a patient with VL? You would give no. it to individual? Uh, that's, that's, yeah, before yeah, developing, that, prevent development of PKDL? That's one study. That's one study. So you uh, give the patient for v VL and look for PKDL. Or, but that is uh, maybe the human challenge. So we, <laughs> that's that's hard, yeah. the, so we, we can vaccinate individual and then we challenge them with, with, with the parasite. <laughs> and that will be a good system for testing prophylactic vaccine. And this right. is why... We, developing human challenge hopefully so we there there are there are multiple there are lots of answers that you have addressed but lots of questions that still remain yes that's that's Sorry, there was some problems with muting there. <laughs> you should be okay. good there. <laughs> yeah. We can't hear you, Michali. Michali is muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, I, th I think there was one more question whether Leishmania vaccines uh, had MF59 as an adjuvant. Uh, well, this was so. So the answer to that is yes. MF fifty nine has been used as an adjuvant for intranasal delivery. They are actually doing uh, intranasal delivery for vaccines using Leishmania amazonensis. So uh, that, that that that's a thing. 
I think if there are no further questions, we could actually uh, 